All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Skype a Scientist's second annual No Time Like the Presentation, where we had um, about 30 scientists submit 90 second video abstracts. And then from those, myself and eight science communicators or um, people who have nothing to do with science whatsoever, uh, watched those videos and chose the most understandable, most engaging 12 of those talks. And so uh, we're going to be listening to six 10 minute talks today. Um, you have the opportunity to ask these scientists uh, questions after their talks. So um, please use the Q&A function um, to ask questions. Um, if you say anything nasty in the chat or in the Q&A, I will kick you out immediately. So everyone, uh, you know, let's learn about stuff and uh, be nice to each other. Um, that's pretty much it. So with that, thank you everyone for, for coming. Thank you for participating and submitting your 90 second abstracts. Uh, I'm super pumped to see uh, what you all tell us about today. So um, without further ado, Abby Stevens, uh, if you would like to kick us off and tell us all about your work, that would be awesome. The rest of us uh, will hide and mute uh, while you have the stage. Yeah, so it's looking full screen to everybody. Looks great. Perfect. Um, so hi, everybody. I am Dr. Abby Stevens. I am an astronomer in Michigan, and I'm going to tell you about X-raying black holes. So briefly, first, um, black holes are when you have a whole lot of stuff or mass in a very, very small space. And so having both a lot of mass and it being really, really compact and dense is what gives it very powerful gravity, the most extreme gravity in the universe. Um, one of the ways that we can measure this kind of gravity is talking about the escape velocity. So everything with mass has an escape velocity. You have to travel faster than that in order to escape the gravitational pull of the thing. On Earth, uh, Earth has an escape velocity. Airplanes do not go faster than the escape velocity which is why they come back down to the ground. They don't escape the Earth. Rocket ships, however, do go faster than the escape velocity of the Earth, and they can go to places like the Moon and Mars and do cool stuff there. With a black hole, its gravity is so, so strong that you would have to travel faster than the speed of light to escape from inside of a black hole. But the speed of light is like the cosmic speed limit. Nothing can go faster than that. So not even light can escape from inside of a black hole. Therefore, they look dark or black to us because we can't see what's inside of them. Um, the black holes that I study um, happen when you have a very big star, it goes supernova and there's a black hole left over at the middle. There's an explosion outward to make a beautiful supernova like the picture you see, and then uh, it implodes and collapses in the middle um, and you left with a core that is, um, you know, tens to 100 times uh, the mass of the sun. So we call these stellar or stellar mass black holes. Um, there are also supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. Our galaxy has one, all the ones we know of have them. Um, that's a little bit different, often the same, but a little bit different. Um, so that's for another time. So stellar mass black holes uh, from collapsing big stars, super strong gravity. We want to study them, um, but we can't just grab one and put it on a table, shine a light on it and um, study it the way you can uh, do things in like biology and chemistry that we might hear about in a, in a moment. Instead, to see one, we have to wait for one to send light in our direction. Um, the closest black hole to us is still many light years away. We've never sent any probe or anything towards it or in one. So we have to just wait for it to send light to us. Um, but as I said, light doesn't come to us from the black hole itself, so we see black holes by looking at the effects they have on their space environments. So the way that I do this, we have about five different ways of doing this, the way I do it is when they are eating their star friends. Scientists call this an x-ray binary. So if you can see my mouse, we have a star friend over here, small star like our sun. And we have a black hole. This is an artist drawing, by the way. Um, so the star front and the black hole are very close to each other and they are orbiting around each other, kind of like how the moon and the earth orbit around each other and they're gravitationally bound. And the star front and the black hole are quite close together, such that this outer stuff from the star is more gravitationally attracted to the black hole than it is to its own star. So the black hole starts to drain the star of its stuff. And as it's draining the stuff, it forms what scientists call an accretion disk, which is like a kind of thick tutu-like thing around the middle of the black hole. This accretion disk gets super, super hot. It gets up to 20 million degrees Fahrenheit. This is about 100 times hotter than the surface of the sun. And so we can look for the heat light coming from this um, to see uh, the extra, to see the accretion disk that's really close to the black hole. So everything that has heat shines heat light. Um, human bodies shine our heat light in what's called the infrared. So that's how like night vision goggles work is you're looking in the infrared. That's how snakes see things, I think. 
that's not my area of expertise. Um, the sun shines its heat light in the visible light, which is how we can see and do things. And this shines its heat light in the x-rays. So to look at the heat light from the accretion disk around the black hole, we look in the x-rays. To do this, we use x-ray telescopes because x-rays from space cannot get through the atmosphere and down to the surface of the Earth. What we are looking at right now is a sped up video of NICER, the neutron star interior composition explorer, which is an X-ray telescope attached to the International Space Station. It's sped up about 200 times. You see this um, solar panels moving around in the background there. Um, so the light comes in these um, circle things on the front, and then there are like computer chip detectors on the back that detect the X-rays. It looks very different from kind of a traditional like optical telescope or even the big radio dishes. Um, but X this is how we observe X-rays. Um, and so nicer is about like um, one yard or one meter cube. So it's like the size of your dishwasher, but it's super fun and exciting because it observes x-rays from near black holes. Uh, I also sometimes use New Star, um, and this is a um, large telescope. The x-rays come in the front here, and then they travel um, many meters down to the detectors on the back. Um, and uh, this lets us look at high energy x-rays as well. So these are the two extra telescopes that are in space right now that I use to look at heat light from black holes. I actually got nicer data earlier today. It's very exciting. Um, so when we're looking at the x-rays from these black holes, they are not always bright. Um, so they go into what we call outburst, where they suddenly get really bright and then they do cool things and we look at them. So um, briefly, the corona, which is this kind of like hot fluffy cloud of electrons. Sometimes it looks like a tall kind of fire hose. Sometimes it's more like a fluffy cloud. This shines high energy bluish x-rays. And then this accretion disk that I mentioned before, this shines low energy reddish x-rays. So as we're going into outburst, um, if first of all, it's quiet. We don't see any x-rays from it. And then the corona gets bright. So we see more high energy bluish x-rays and then it gets brighter and brighter. And then that goes away and we see a lot of disc, a lot of low energy reddish x-rays coming from it where it might look a lot brighter like this. And there's kind of a little corona, but not really. Um, and then as it's um, dimming again afterwards, um, we see a bright corona again as it gets dimmer and dimmer until eventually we can't see it at all anymore. So this um, quiet corona, disc corona, quiet, cycle happens over several months. Uh, it's currently happening with two of my favorite black holes right now. One of them is like in the almost disk phase and one of them is just stopping to be quiet, which is very exciting. Um, we look at this over several months. Um, so what what we're looking, what I'm looking at in particular as it's changing through these different types of x-ray light that it shines um, is for weird and wonky stuff happening really close to the black hole because of its extreme gravity. One of these things um, is possibly having like a tilt-a-whirl type corona. So we see very, very rapid wiggles in the X-ray light that are faster than one second. Um, scientists call these quasi-periodic oscillations. Um, and this is super, super fast for something to be moving. Um, and so I wanna know what is moving that fast and how is it doing that? Um, so one of the ways that we think this could be happening, this is a computer simulation, is um, the black hole is spinning around and it's dragging stuff around with it. And then we see the changing light from that. I can't see my PowerPoint clock, so I don't know how I'm doing. Um, so we think that maybe the corona is playing tilt-a-whirl and it's moving around and it's causing these um, fast little wiggles in the x-ray light that we see. So when I'm looking for this, this is when we have both disc and corona emission. So it's in like the intermediate state because like most things, when you're having a little bit of both, it's like the most exciting to see the interplay between them. So in summary, um, black holes have the most extreme gravity in the universe. Um, and some black holes eat stars and then we see the heat light with X-ray telescopes of these black holes eating the stars. Um, the X-ray light that we get from them is not constant um, and these changes can tell us what is happening really close to the black hole. Um, I can't see my timer whatsoever so I have no idea how I'm doing but that's what I've got. Thanks very much everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much. And just so everybody knows, um, we're not going to cut anybody off today. Uh, if you are shy of 10 minutes, cool. If you're over 10 minutes, that's also cool. Uh, don't we, that, we don't need that kind of stress in our lives, particularly this year. So yeah. we're aiming for 10 minutes, but, but whatever. Um, okay. That was awesome. Um, Thanks. And let's get to some questions. So Gina K wants to know, um, what do you need to major in in order to study black holes? Yeah, 
Um, so you can major in physics or astronomy. Um, astronomy is typically only at like the much bigger universities. Um, oftentimes people will come in with a physics background. So I did physics as a bachelor student and I did like mathematical physics. So I did a lot of math. Um, we use a lot of math and computer programming to do all of this stuff. So taking all of those classes is really important. Um, Cause also if you don't like that, then you know to maybe look into something else. Um, and you then, um, as you're going into graduate school for a master's and a PhD, um, you then are looking at more astronomy and astrophysics type programs, which are sometimes joint with the physics department, sometimes they're their own department. Only a couple of the really, really big universities have their own separate astronomy department. Um, yeah, physics and astronomy. Awesome. And then we had uh, CP, who is a seven, uh, seven year old, asked the same question. So, yeah. uh, so great. Um, so, my, okay, when you're talking about a star stealing or no the black hole stealing the stuff from the star yeah. is it just stealing the light or is it stealing the exploded gas it's stealing the actual stuff so the star is mostly hydrogen gas on the outside of it and then there's like heavier stuff in the middle that it's fusing and burning together and stuff um and so it's stealing the hydrogen gas from it and then that gas is shining light so we see the light um, but it's mostly when that gas is like mixing together in the accretion disk, it's like it, there's like a lot of friction. It's fluid plasma dynamics. So it's, it's like very complicated friction, but it's friction. And so it gets really hot and then it shines the X-ray light. And that's so you how you have that. little explosions uh, like you would on the surface of the sun happening in the accretion disk. You probably do. We can't, they would be so small that we can't see them. Like the, the, the black holes eating stars are like too far away for us to really resolve that. Mm -hmm. That's probably happening. And it would be super cool if we could see that, but um, not yet. Cool. And last questions from Preston. How do you see black holes? Yeah, so the only way that we can see them is when we see the effects they have on the space environment around them. So like what I was showing is how they're eating their star friend. If the star weren't there, we wouldn't see the black hole whatsoever. We only see it because of this accretion disk that's around it. And actually, we can't even see the spatial like resolution of that. We just like when I'm looking at these, it's just like a bright point. It's a point source. We have taken a picture of a supermassive black hole. Um, the Event Horizon Telescope put out another big release i think like two weeks ago now um where these black holes are much bigger so you can actually see like the ring almost like this um video i've got on right here you can kind of, like see like the ring around of like light that's shining out from stuff right before it falls into the black hole and we can see black holes by how they affect the orbits of stars like in the center of our galaxy very cool well thank you so yeah. much for sharing that with yeah. us Matt. thank you um, um very cool. Okay, next up, we've got Emily Lind. Emily, the floor is yours. Hi. All right. So I'm going to share my screen and then we can get cracking. Share. All right. Can everybody see this? Yeah, it looks like um, like edit mode right now. Uh, now it looks like. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I'm just going to turn on my little laser pointer here and then we can get started. All right. Um, okay, so hi everybody. Um, my name is Emily Lind. I'm a graduate student at Queen's University, which is in Canada. And I'm going to use my time today to tell you about my research, which is all about antifreeze proteins. So I want to start, this is going to sound a little crazy, with a story time. So I want you to imagine that you are a fish about 250 million years ago. And for most of your existence and the existence of all the fish that came before you, things have been really nice. The water's been warm, things have been going great. But then suddenly and unexpectedly, you are living in an ice age. And if you can't come up with a way to present yourself from freezing to death, you and all your other fish friends and all your fish children are going to die. So what are you gonna do? Well, what one solution to this problem is, is for you as a fish to evolve an antifreeze protein which will keep you from freezing to death and this is exactly what fish and many other species did during the last cenozoic ice age which was about 250 million years ago all right so this then begs the question of well what is an antifreeze protein well antifreeze proteins are present in many different types of animals okay so you have them in fish like the atlantic herring you have them in insects like the snow flea, and you also have them in plants like winter rye, as well as bacteria, which I didn't put on the slide. But 
all of these proteins are structurally different. Um, they have a couple similar characteristics, but they're very, very structurally diverse. But they all have the same main purpose, which is to protect these organisms from freezing to death um, at temperatures that are really, really low. And all of these proteins do this by binding to ice crystals when they're tiny, tiny, and keeping them from growing any bigger. So for example, you can picture that um, in the herring, for example, down here, if it has a tiny ice crystal in, let's say, its blood system, and then that crystal um, starts growing and growing and growing, uh, it's going to form kind of like an ice clot in the fish, and that's going to destroy the fish tissue and eventually kill it. So having these antifreeze proteins prevents the ice crystal from growing, keeps it nice and small, and lets the fish survive below freezing. All right, so antifreeze proteins are obviously very useful for bugs and fish, but what good are they to us? We're warm blooded. We don't need to keep from freezing. Um, well, as it turns out, there's a lot of really amazing industrial purposes that we can use antifreeze proteins for. So one way that antifreeze proteins are currently being used is to keep frozen foods like ice cream um, at a nice texture and consistency. So right now, as I speak in your freezer, if you have some ice cream, it might very well have some antifreeze proteins in it. More industrially speaking, we could use antifreeze proteins to keep planes from freezing over, to keep um, freezers and uh, fridges from having a lot of ice in them, and also to keep power lines from uh, freezing over during extreme weather events. And on the topic of extreme weather events, we could also maybe genetically engineer antifreeze proteins into crops like let's say corn, corn or soybeans to keep them resistant to extreme weather events so you know you wouldn't have as many food shortages. And then perhaps most excitingly, we could use antifreeze proteins to better preserve human organs for transplant. And this would increase the longevity of these organs and make it so that they're more accessible to the people who need them most. All right, so. I want to take you now through my goals for today. My first goal, which hopefully I have accomplished, was to get you interested in antifreeze proteins. Now I want to walk you through my research plan, which consists of searching, growing, and testing new antifreeze proteins. And then finally, I want to tell you why my research matters to you at a personal and possibly political level. But first, I have to explain a little bit more of uh, the science of what I'm doing, right? So I am studying the type 2 antifreeze proteins, which are found in three lineages of fish, the Atlantic herring, the sea raven, and the smelt down here. And what you might notice by this tree is that these three fish species are very evolutionarily diverse, and yet they have almost identical antifreeze proteins. And this is very strange because nobody else in their family tree has these antifreeze proteins. Now, if this, had, this protein had evolved in a normal linear fashion, all these other fish would probably have either this exact antifreeze protein or at least a trace of it. So it's very strange that none of them have it. And this begs the question, well, how do these barely related fish all have the same antifreeze protein? So my lab has proposed that the answer to this question is lateral gene transfer. So instead of this protein evolving in a normal linear fashion, um, this protein or the gene for this protein was transferred directly from the Atlantic herring down into the smelt lineage, like a direct thing, almost like trading Pokemon cards. But the mystery doesn't end there because the Atlantic herring doesn't seem to have been the fish that evolved this protein. So it must have been traded in from somewhere else. And that's exactly the question that I'm trying to explore. Where did this protein come from? How did it evolve amongst these fish? And I'm answering this question, or I'm hoping to answer this question, using a three-step research process, which consists of me searching for other candidate proteins in other fish species, growing these proteins in insect cells, and then harvesting those proteins and testing them to see if they can bind ice. So I now want to walk you through an example of this process. So recently I found a possible antifreeze protein in a fish called a rough skin sculpin, which is related to um, codids and sea raven um, fish. And as you can see by comparing the protein here on the left to the protein on the right, they look very, very similar. You can see they have similar alpha helices, 
and similar beta sheets, and they've got the same kind of roughly triangular shape. Unfortunately, um, this isn't really that significant because this is just what a C-type ladder lectin looks like. So to prove that this Ruskin pro sculpin protein might actually be an antifreeze protein, I have to look at it a little bit more specifically. And so I can do that by comparing um, these five calcium binding residues. So you can see that the Atlantic herring, um, kind of almost like a diamond in a ring, is able to hold on to this calcium ion really tightly by the use of these five residues. And lo and behold, it looks like the Ruskin sculpin protein can do the exact same thing, which is pretty cool. But perhaps more importantly, the Atlantic herring protein has these four residues, which are actually the part that holds on to the ice. So these four side chains are the side chains that interact with the ice crystal and hold it in its tiny form. And promisingly, if you look at the rough skin sculpt here on the left, you can see that some of these residues are almost the exact same. And the ones that aren't the exact same have a kind of similar shape to them. So if the rough skin sculpt doesn't bind ice already, I might just be able to make one or two mutations and create an ice binding protein. So that seems pretty exciting. So this means that, okay, I found a protein that I want to study. Now, how do I get it? Well, you might think, well, why don't I just get a rough skin sculpin and take the protein out of its blood, let's say. That would work. The only problem is that this fish is from Korea. And right now I can't go to Korea and the fish cannot easily come to me, which means that I've got to come up with another way to get this protein. Thankfully, one strategy that I can use is to recombinantly express the gene for this protein in insect cells. And a great um, reason to use this system is that I can add a little fluorescent tag to my protein. And this is very useful because it means that when I'm growing the protein in these insect cells, I can see the protein glowing. And that lets me know that, yes, I am producing a protein and it's time for me to harvest it. So then once I've harvested the protein, I can move on to testing it. And there's a couple different ways I do this, but the, not the first way is through something called a thermal hysteresis assay, which I'm showing you right here. And for some reason, I cannot get the video to pause, but it'll loop. So what this is showing you is a tiny little lemon-shaped ice crystal, or will in just a second, once the video loops. And this ice crystal is being held in place by tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny antifreeze proteins all around it. And you can see that even though the temperature is below freezing, um, the ice crystal is still, oh, and my video just crashed. Can you still see my screen? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay, well, we have experienced some unexpected technical difficulties where my PowerPoint has Don't completely crashed. In the times of Zoom, we must roll with it. <laughs> All right, and let's see where we are. Here we are, okay. And we we're going along so swimmingly. All right, um, present. And are you gonna cooperate for me, my little beastie? All right, there we go, all right, we're back on track. So, this little lemon-shaped object right here is a single ice crystal that's being held in tiny, tiny form by teeny, teeny, tiny antifreeze proteins, which you, you can't see, but trust me, they're there. And the interesting thing is that this ice crystal is being held in place even though we're well below the freezing point of water, right? We're at like negative 0.2. Usually the water would just be a solid ice crystal by now, but the antifreeze protein is keeping that crystal from growing. However, the antifreeze protein is only so strong. And once we get to a certain point, you get a tiny little burst and all of a sudden the ice will take over the entire sample. See that? And so by looking at the temperature at which that burst occurs, I can learn some really valuable information about my antifreeze protein. And furthermore, as I showed you at the beginning, um, in this case, the um, crystal is held as a little lemon shape. But that isn't, and it's crashed again. That isn't always the case, as I'm going to show you as soon as this starts working again. Um, the crystal doesn't have to be a little lemon shape. It can actually be um, a little hexagon or almost like a little flower um, or lots of different other shapes um, for the crystal to be, which we will show you 
right here. Um, so you can see from this slide, the crystal is present in uh, many different shapes, which is pretty cool. And right. OK, there's the different shapes crystals. Pretty interesting, pretty cool to see. And I can, um, by studying my interface proteins, I can compare the shape that the crystal takes on and um, then learn valuable information about how my antifreeze protein is exactly binding to the ice crystal in question. Okay, so um, forgive those technical difficulties, but we are now at my summary slide. Um, so to recap the, the uh, slight bit of chaos there, I am studying antifreeze proteins. And more specifically, I am looking for the original type two antifreeze protein. And my lab has proposed that these antifreeze proteins evolved through lateral gene transfer rather than a strictly linear normal evolutionary progression. So if I can find more proof um, of this lateral gene transfer from one fish species directly into another, it will suggest that lateral gene transfer is a naturally occurring process amongst a vertebrate species, which is pretty cool. We knew that this kind of thing could happen with bacteria and with bugs, but for it to be able to happen with vertebrate species like you and I, it's kind of a big deal. Um, so why does this matter to you as a person, right? Why does this matter to the government? Well, lateral gene transfer with vertebrate species is really, really similar to genetically modified organisms, which a lot of people are very worried about because people think that scientists, you know, taking a gene from one plant and adding it to another plant or taking it from one animal and adding it to another animal um, is unnatural or unsafe. But if lateral gene transfer is occurring all around us in nature all the time, is this really that unsafe, right? And, you know, if it isn't actually that unsafe, um, should we be afraid of it? Should the government be afraid of it, right? These are the kind of questions that my research uh, hopes to address in this later stages. And so with that, I'm at the end of my presentation. Um, to remind you, I'm Emily Lind. I'm a graduate student um, at Queen's University. My research is funded by the Canadian Institute of Health Research. And if you want to learn more about what I do, uh, please check out the Canadian Science Fair Journal. We are accepting papers from students, and we're also looking for new editors. Um, and so that's the end. I'd love to hear your questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was so cool. OK. so. Um, here's a question from the Catawba Science Center program. Um, how will the proteins mm -hmm. mentioned as being biotic, so like in animals, um, be used in abiotic, mm -hmm. not uh, organic, not animally uh, things like power lines? Yeah, so what we would do is, um, and this is purely hypothetical, but what we could do is we could um, grow the proteins recombinantly in, let's say, bacteria cells or some type of a mammalian cell expression system or insect cells, and then harvest those proteins out and then use them as kind of an industrial coating um, on power lines or in freezers. To do this, we would probably have to add a little bit of bioengineering. So maybe we would attach the antifreeze protein to an adhesion protein. And then the adhesion protein would stick to the power line, and then the antifreeze protein would keep the ice from coating on the power line, right? Um, so that's just one possibility of how we might use that. Awesome. So you showed that really, really cool looking picture of the different ice crystals in containment looking yeah. so different from each other. Like, are do you know or even like guess as to why different shapes are in different animals? Like, are are they? useful for the different animals or, or what? Yeah, so I mean, there might be an element of usefulness, like you say. I think that it has more to do with how the um, antifreeze protein is interacting with the crystal plane, right? So as you, you may or may not know, um, ice is like water molecules arranged in a lattice, right? So mm -hmm. it's kind of this hexagon shape. And depending on the side of that crystal, that the antifreeze protein binds, um, it's going to induce a different kind of change in the overall shape of the antifreeze uh, or of the crystal, right? right? So that's why you see those different shapes. Um, so it has more to do with how this particular species evolved their antifreeze protein and how those contacts are being made. 
Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. That was super cool. Um, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, sorry for all the chaos. I don't know why I kept crashing. Don't worry about it. I, it's always, it's always, uh, we're doing the best we can with the technology we have these days. Okay. Uh, yeah. Next up, we've got Lisa Dazzle. Lisa, you have the stage. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Great. Okay. I'm assuming that you can see my screen now. Looks great. Yep. Okay, great. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Dazzle. I am a third year doctoral student in the counseling psychology program at Iowa State University. So my presentation is on Black people's perceptions of racial inequalities, and it is, it is a critical phenomenological study. So first, I want to define what racial inequalities is. It is the intentional unequal treatment and the systematic disproportionate allocation of resources to a group based on race. So within our society, which operates as a white supremacist, racist, capitalist patriarchy, that means that white people are seen as superior and black people are seen as inferior. As a result of this white supremacist ideology, black people receive less resources. And these are reflected in different systems and with racial inequalities. So in my study, I focus on four specific racial inequalities, employment, income, healthcare, and police violence. So first, for employment, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, unemployment is twice as high for Black Americans compared to white Americans. When it comes to income, white workers earn 21% more than Black workers, and that difference is around $1,018 compared to Black workers who make $806 weekly. So you can definitely see the stark difference in income there. Next, we have police violence disparities. Black people are three times more likely to be murdered by police in comparison to white Americans. And when we come to healthcare inequities, Black Americans with coronavirus are 2.1 times more likely to die compared to white Americans with coronavirus. Of course, that is a problem. So social dominance theory, which is the theoretical framework that guides my study, suggests that legitimizing myths, which are stereotypes, prejudice, um, discriminatory ideologies, white supremacist ideologies, are what justify these racial inequalities. So essentially legitimizing myths tell us why society is the way it is. And I'm going to get into some of these legitimizing myths. So there are several myths that exist about the Black community. And I'm sure right now, if I ask you to put in the chat one stereotype you've heard about Black people, several responses might say that they've heard that Black people are lazy, Black people are criminals, Black people are aggressive. So these kinds of myths about the Black community has been around since chattel slavery, since the 1400s, right? And so they continue to maintain and remain within our current society. So we have the myth of Black laziness. There's this idea that Black people don't work hard, that they're lazy. And this myth of Black laziness influences um, Black people's ability to seek employment as well as to receive adequate compensation for their labor. So you can think about it in this way. If an employer thinks that a Black person is lazy, they won't want to hire them. If they think that a Black person is lazy, then they won't want to pay them for the labor that they're doing, right? So then you start to see how these justifications are used in order to maintain racial inequalities. So the next legitimizing myth that exists about the Black community is that of Black violence. There's this idea that Black people are inherently criminals, inherently aggressive, and inherently violent, which of, violent, which of course contributes to police violence disparities. Now, the other myth is that of Black genetic inferiority. So now with COVID-19, healthcare disparities are very salient within our society. And a common explanation of why Black people are dying at disproportionate rates to COVID-19 is because Black people are supposedly more susceptible to diabetes, hypertension, and other chronic illnesses such as asthma. And 
This is of course a myth because black people are not inherently susceptible to these things. This is actually a result of systemic inequities and things such as environmental racism. So when black people start to buy into these myths that exist about the black community, this is called internalized racial oppression. And internalized racial oppression is the incorporation and acceptance by individuals within an oppressed group of the prejudices or stereotypes against them within the dominant society. So for example, this would be black people believing that the black community is violent, is lazy, and is inherently susceptible to different chronic illnesses. So internalized racial oppression leads to blaming black people for systemic inequities. It also impacts black people's physical and psychological wellness leading to depression, anxiety. It also makes black people have lower self-esteem, uh, self-hatred, and so it influences the way that Black people see themselves and creates shame around being Black. So previous studies have examined racial inequalities and Black people's awareness of racial inequalities. So one study by Hirsch and Jack in 2012 examined 150 middle and working class Black Americans, asking them, what do you think are some obstacles facing African Americans right now? And participants responded with nine salient obstacles of racism, lack of racial solidarity, family, economics, education, youth, opportunity, incarceration, and crime. So while participants were asked to identify obstacles impacting the Black community, which of course are impacted by racial inequalities, they were not asked about their own perceptions of the systemic root of these inequities. So in other words, they weren't asked how did these inequities come to be? And then they weren't asked about ways to navigate away from these inequities. So essentially black advancement and black liberation. So then in an earlier study in 1991, King asked 57 white students for their reaction to social inequalities. So what King did was provide students with a statistic. So they, they were asked, compared to white children, black children are twice as likely to die in the first year of life. How did our society get to be this way? And then they had to respond by writing essays. What King found was that individuals lacked the consideration of the various interlocking systems that impact Black people's oppression, right? So often what participants did was focus on one central point, whether that be slavery, whether that be discrimination, or whether that be Black people not pulling themselves up by their bootstrap. So while previous studies did examine racial inequalities direct, indirectly, um, they didn't look at specific racial inequalities related to income, employment, healthcare disparities, and police violence. Also, participants were not asked um, the systemic roots of these inequities, as well as what Black advancement and Black liberation may look like after considering these racial inequities. So no study has focused on all three of these components during a global pandemic and an upcoming election, which is what makes my study different. So my research questions that guide my study are first, how do black people explain present day racial inequalities? So we hear about the inequities that exist all the time with black people, especially now during COVID, we hear that black people are dying disproportionately. However, what tends to happen within the research realm is that black people are reported on or talked about, but never actually asked how these things are impacting them or what their critical ideas and thoughts about these inequities are. So that's what I want to do. I want to understand how Black people explain and understand these racial inequalities. Next, um, my second research question is how do Black people understand the root of oppression? So I ask Black people, how did our society get to be this way? Following, what do Black people believe is necessary for Black advancement? So we just talked about the forms of oppression and the systems of oppression. So what does liberation and what does advancement look like to Black people within our current society? So like I said before, my study is a critical phenomenological qualitative study. And what that means is phenomenological means that I'm focusing on participants' lived experiences and really valuing Black people's voices. In terms of critical research, that focuses on examining privilege, power, and hierarchical systems, which systematically oppress and marginalize communities of color, aka white supremacy, racism, capitalism, patriarchy.
So I interviewed 12 Black participants from New York City. Their age ranges were from 8, 19 to 28, and they were recruited via word of mouth, snowball sampling, and purposive sampling. So I had participants email me or get in contact with me if they were interested. They completed an online consent form saying that they do want to participate in the study. After I interviewed them um, via WebEx, which is a similar system to Zoom, and then um, their, during the interviews, our interviews were recorded, and afterwards they were transcribed um, by the Dazzle research team. And then I'm in the process of coding it and writing up the results now. So just to give you a little idea of what participants were asked during the interview, they were presented with the same statistics that you heard at the beginning about employment, about income, about health care, and about police violence. And then they were asked, why do you think this is? Please state all reasons you believe this is the case. And so participants had the time to fully express why they think these inequities exist. Afterwards, they were asked, how did our society get to be this way? So taking into consideration the racial inequalities we talked about earlier, they were asked to think about the origin of these inequities. Then they were asked, what can be done to advance the Black community? And what does Black liberation look like to you? So now in the process of coding, um, it's my job to figure out what the themes, what the central, general, and unique themes are that make up participants' responses in order to answer my research questions, which again is how do Black people explain present-day racial inequalities of employment, income, healthcare, and police violence? How do Black people understand the root of oppression? Essentially, how did our society get to be this way? And what do Black people believe is necessary for Black advancement? So um, I'll open to questions now. Thank you all. All right, thank you so much for your really important work and for sharing it with us today. This was uh, really, really interesting. So we've got a couple of questions uh, for you here. So the first one um, is from Lamira. Um, how does your study and your work help with abolishing the myths against black people? And, and to like a little elaborate on that question, like how do you take this work um, and then like apply it to make things better than they are? Yes, I love that question. Thank you, Lamira, for your question. So in terms of abolishing and recognizing these myths, I think the first part is about recognizing that they exist. So in doing the research to find these myths and to find um, literatures that mention these myths, it was actually very difficult. So while we know it exists, it's difficult to find in the research like very blatant forms of, okay, Black people are considered lazy, Black people are considered violent, right? And so having participants first express that they are aware of these myths serves to serves as an example that these myths definitely exist. And so my research could be used to cite that those myths exist, but also um, when writing up my research, I provide implications for further studies as well as for educators and psychologists. So I myself am an educator and um, a psychologist. So I intend to use um, what I've learned in order to shape the way that I practice teaching as well as um, my clinical work. So I think that the more research that gets done you, with, the, with Black people, the more that they have the opportunity to share their voices and their experiences, and the more people have the chance to like listen to Black people and understand like what's happening for them and be able to change the way that we all practice and move. And hopefully um, educators can become attuned to what's happening and the ways in which people um, buy into these myths and how they operate from that internalized racial oppressive view and then begin to teach in a way that addresses these myths but then also debunks it and then teaches um, students as well to debunk these myths. That's awesome, thanks. Um, we have another question from the same uh, asker. What does black advancement look like to you? Yeah, thank you for that question. So black advancement for me looks like abolishing systems um, and I really think that it's complex, but it also indicate it also requires that um, 
Black people address the issues that are in the Black community. And by issues, I mean issues that have come from white supremacy, meaning like, you know, fat phobia, colorism, ableism, all of the isms, transphobia, et cetera, right? So really starting to work on this as well as healing. So recognizing that these problems exist, recognizing the roots of these problems, talking about it and healing from it. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing this. That was uh, really, really, really important and cool. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. All right. The next scientist we have is Sarja uh, Dasgupta. You have the stage. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, can you can you hear me? Okay. Good. Uh, so so Lisa just discussed uh, a lot of uh, important racial inequalities inequities uh, that are that exist in today's society and that was very important to know but now for my talk i'm going to take you all to a society a billions of years ago where we have to look for look at how our all of our ancestors looked like there were no divisions they're all our common ancestors so uh, before i launch into my thing i'd like to thank uh, skype a scientist and sarah for putting um, all of this together you mean uh, this is so important to preserve a sense of uh, social integrity and a sense of uh, community. So thank you all. Now I'm gonna share the screen. Hopefully you will let me know when the screen is shared. Okay, so can you see my slide in full screen mode? Yes, looks good. Awesome, okay. So as I said, it's, you know, we spent the last year, uh, largely isolated from each other, from our friends, all by ourselves. And I'm sure at some point you just got tired of looking at screens and notifications and you just like sat there thinking. And uh, under these situations, you know, thoughts start with questions like, um, you know, what's for dinner tonight? Or uh, should I be working out more? And then all of a sudden you end up thinking about deeper questions like, you know, what happens when we die? Or where did we come from? So where did we come from? How was life born out of non-living matter? You know, humanity has been trying to answer this question for the last five millennia, and we are still asking. As you can see, the two fingers don't quite meet up. And that gap between those two fingers represents uh, my current obsession. So I want to make life in the lab from scratch using non-living matter that would have been present on early Earth about four billion years ago. Now, this might seem like an incredibly difficult thing to do. It is somewhat hard, but today my goal is to convince all of you that it's not quite as hard as you might think it is. You know, if you think about it, uh, learning a new language as a toddler <laughs> might seem very, very daunting because when you're a three-year-old, you know about a few hundred words. Now as an adult, you're capable of, of creating almost an infinite number of sentences. So how did this happen? The reason that this was possible is because you learned a little thing called grammar when you're small. And grammar told you how you could put together letters and words into sentences and paragraphs in a way that made linguistic sense. So now let's take all of life and then break it down into its chemical grammar and then try to put together the basic components of life in a way that makes scientific sense. And the first step uh, toward that is considering the cell, which is after all the fundamental unit of life. And to me, cells are just sacks of genes and enzymes. And as we all know, enzymes are the workers of the cell. They make stuff, they do stuff in the cell. And uh, genes are like uh, the chief architects of the cell. So they hold the blueprint for the cell. Now in modern highly evolved cells of today, genes are made of DNA. And then the message that is contained within DNA gets transferred to a cousin molecule called RNA. Of course, RNA is now all the rage because it's the main ingredient in a lot of the coronavirus vaccines that you must have taken. Uh, and this RNA message gets translated to make proteins, which are the enzymes of the cell. So proteins do most of the work in the cell. So this biological trinity looks kind of neat, but you know, all this would have been a little too much for primitive life to handle. So. If, I mean, in fact, proteins, in fact, by themselves are way too complex to have emerged without highly evolved and specialized biological processes. So if there was a single entity that could function as both genes and enzymes, then life, you know, literally would have been much simpler. And we know that life was simpler way back when. 
And fortunately, there is such an entity, which is good old RNA. You know, not all genes have to be made with DNA. Some genes can be made with RNA as well. You know, ask the coronavirus. All of its genes are in fact made of RNA. And then there's the story of the ribosome, which is the machine in our cells that make proteins. Now, if you go deep into the ribosome, you'll find an enzyme sitting there that actually makes all the proteins. And that enzyme is not made of protein, but it's made of RNA. So the very fact that an enzyme made of RNA still makes all of the proteins that we can ever need sort of suggests that the earliest enzymes on Earth were likely also made of RNA. And all of this collectively points to a, a stage in the Earth's history where all of life was in fact made or based on RNA. Now, if you are an RNA-based life form, right, then what is that one thing that you need to learn to do really, really well? You need to learn how to make lots of RNA. And as I said, without proteins being present, without any protein enzymes being present, these, these processes would have been carried out by enzymes that were themselves made of RNA. We call them ribozymes. Of course, now we no longer live in an RNA world, right? All of biology's RNAs are now made, of, made by protein enzymes, right? So these ancient ribozymes that made more RNA are now extinct. So there is no real way to you know, go into nature and look for them and study them. But of course, we can resurrect these ancient enzymes in the lab by a process called directed evolution. And I'm going to tell you exactly what I did here. Okay, so I started with a small collection of 100 trillion RNA molecules in a small tube, and then I challenged them with the task of making RNA from small pieces. And the way I set the system up, if a single RNA molecule from that tube, from that collection, could make RNA, they would be selected. If not, they would be discarded. And I had a machine called a sequencer identify the correct RNA sequences, the correct RNA molecules that could actually make some RNA. So these were the chosen ones, right? So by repeating this process several times, I was able to identify enzymes made of RNA that made different RNAs. Okay, so now if, if you're one of those uh, that, who's like listening to this talk, more carefully than others, you would immediately spot the problem here. You know, I'm saying that you need enzymes to make RNA, correct? And I'm also saying that those enzymes are themselves made of RNA. So where did the first enzymes come from? So this is a valid question and it's, it's kind of a philosophical conundrum, but you know, we went ahead and did experiments and what we found was very interesting. What we found was that in the presence of amino acids, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And we know for a fact that there were a lot of amino acids on early earth. So in the presence of amino acids, short pieces of RNA can slowly come together and make longer pieces of RNA, right? So once a few good enzymes emerge out of this slow self-assembly process, these enzymes would now sort of very quickly take over and make more of themselves thus creating this self-sustaining system that life desperately requires. So I hope with that, uh, we were at least somewhat able to uh, take care of the RNA side of things. Now to create, uh, recreate ancient life in the lab, we need a cell, of course. And we think that uh, fatty acids would have been an important ingredient for primitive cells. So, you know, phospholipids, which are made of fatty acids and phosphates and glycerol, these phospholipids are the building blocks of modern cell membranes. But we think fatty acids would have been the building blocks of ancient cell membranes because fatty acids can be made by processes that are not biological. And a very interesting fact for you guys, fatty acid molecules have been found in meteorites that have crashed from outer space onto earth, right? And also interesting is that Fatty acids can spontaneously form these spherical packs that can capture stuff that's lying around, including RNA. And all of you have made these fatty acid sacs when taking a bath because soaps are salts of fatty acids, right? So in principle, soap bubbles are like these primitive cell-like compartments that you've, you've all made at some point without even realizing it. So uh, let's get back to some experiments then. So we took our RNA enzymes we took short pieces of RNA, we put them in these fatty acid sacs, and then we waited anxiously to see what was gonna happen. And then after a couple of hours, we carefully broke these fatty acid sacs and then analyzed what was inside. 
And to our delight, we found that the short pieces of RNA that we had put in the sac were now joined together to form longer RNA molecules. So an RNA enzyme, an enzyme made of RNA, made longer RNA inside a fatty acid cell, perhaps for the first time in 4 billion years. That was very, very exciting for us. Now, when what happens when a cell makes a lot of RNA? It grows, right? And then it divides, right? So the next, I'm going to show you a little clip, which is not exactly the data that we observed, but it's basically a synthesis of experimental results obtained from separate um, experiments. So this uh, video will show you how making RNA inside these fatty acid sacs can make it grow and then divide. So here is it. This is the red fatty acid sac, and then we have the short RNA building blocks on the outside. So let's see what happens. So these building blocks slowly diffuse into the interior of the cell, and then the RNA enzyme sits waiting for those building blocks. And then the RNA enzyme uses those building blocks to make copies of itself. And as the cell slowly stretches out, out and it divides into two daughter cells, each daughter cell gets to keep one copy of that that RNA enzyme. And this is how cell division works even today. Now, we have in fact experimentally observed um, growth and division of fatty acids, but empty fatty acids, right? So, and I also showed you how RNA enzymes can make long RNAs inside the same fatty acids. So now my next important goal is to put these two together to demonstrate what you saw on the video exactly. Like I want to, demonstrate growth and division of fatty acid cells with RNA enzymes inside them making longer and longer RNA. And uh, this might seem simple, um, this might seem simple, but it has profound implications. So imagine you have two cells, right, with slightly different enzymes in them. Now, the, the cell that has a better enzyme will make more RNA, right? It will grow fatter and it will make more babies faster. So ultimately these cell, cells will take over the entire population. And you know, this is a very, very, very special and rare moment because this is when systems that we put together from non-living matter have started to evolve spontaneously. So this is where life would be born. Now, once again, uh, as I said at the very outset, we are not quite there yet, but I hope that I was able to convince you that we are tantalizingly close to finally figuring out where we all came from. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so weird and cool. Uh, so, okay, I have a question. Um, so when I am, you know, doing the dishes or what have you, I often see bubbles blobbing, like have, being two bubbles and then becoming one bubble. But like, I don't usually see one bubble like spontaneously spinning into two bubbles without like, I'm a, I'm a cell biologist, so I'm thinking about like cinching proteins and all the, the, the mechanics that we have in cells that forces them to split into two. So when you have these little lipid circles, spheres rather, are you seeing them pull apart in your experiments? Right, so good question. I mean, so when you have soap bubbles, for example, what happens when you tap them or touch them? Sometimes they break into two soap bubbles, right? So these are very similar. And in fact, we have observed that if you take a fatty acid, we call them vesicles, so the fatty acid vesicles, and then you can just, if you agitate them mildly, or if you shine light on them, they would basically sort of pearl and break apart into not necessarily just two daughter cells, but many daughter right. cells. Cool. So. Awesome. We've got a question uh, coming in from Beth Castle. Do you think DNA was around at the same time or do you think it showed up later? So the general, con of course, like the, the difficulty in this area of research is that you can never be 100% certain because you cannot sort of go back in time and see what was happening. But looking at modern biology, even in modern biology, the building blocks of DNA, which are deoxygenated, nucleotides are actually made from ribonucleotides by an enzyme, which sort of tells us that DNA building blocks were probably initially made from RNA building blocks. So we think that it was RNA at the beginning and then RNA, so these enzymes that I was talking about, ribozymes, RNA enzymes, they somehow learned how to make, stitch together single blocks of amino acids to make proteins. And then these proteins sort of took over as the enzymes and then made, our, uh, made DNA ultimately. And then this led to the formation of the biological trinity that we see today. Cool. Um, one last question. So 
this was happening a long, long time ago when there wasn't a lot of other life hanging around. Um, and now we have, uh, so if, if you are ever working with RNA in the lab, you know that you gotta be really, really careful with that stuff to not have it break down because humans, for example, were covered in these little, and I know that you know this, but for the audience, like we're covered in these little proteins that chop RNA into little bits. And that's all part of our immune system. So keeping RNA in its, original form is wicked challenging um, out in the world. So is, do you think, this is, this is where I actually get to the question, do you think that this is happening in like ponds and in the ocean all the time? Or was it like we that ship has sailed for initiating new life because of the amount of RNAs that uh, life is pumping out all the time? Yeah, that, that, that is a very interesting question. And I mean, anyone who has ever worked with RNA would know that you have to be very careful, change your gloves all the time and things like that, because you do have ribonucleases that chop off RNA. But, you know, we are talking about a time when there were no proteins, so there were no ribonucleases. So that's out of the way. And uh, to the previous question, actually, the reason why we think that DNA ultimately took over RNA's role as genes is because DNA is in fact more stable in water than RNA. So RNA breaks down rather quickly. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't think that uh, there is life uh, emerging out of these uh, warm little ponds that Darwin described currently. Uh, but uh, it's, it's true that RNA is probably not the ideal material to make life because it breaks down so fast. But you have to understand that once a certain length of RNA has been made, so it makes it, it gets made it, and it gets broken down. But we are talking about geological time scales here. So once a little small little RNA enzyme is made, it can accelerate the process many, 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 many fold and everything becomes suddenly so fast. So we just need that little bit of RNA enzyme to be formed and then we are set to go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. That was that was super fun and super cool. Um, next up, we've got Amelia. Amelia, you have the stage. All right, give me just a second. All right, does that look good? Looks good. All right, perfect. So let me minimize image here. Alrighty, so hello, my name is Amelia Zietlo. I am a PhD student at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and I will be talking about my research on a group of animals called mosasaurs. So some of you might be familiar with mosasaurs, as one of them was featured in the new Jurassic World movies, but if not, imagine basically a giant aquatic Komodo dragon. Now the one in the movie is a little bit ridiculous, I think it's like a hundred feet long, the real ones didn't grow to be quite that big, but they definitely were not small. Most of them ranged from about 10 to 30 feet long, with some species, including my favorite, Pertylosaurus proriger, growing to be almost 50 feet long, with skulls that are longer than most people are tall. To put that size into perspective for you, that's bigger than Sue, the Tyrannosaurus rex at the Chicago Field Museum. So the next time that you visit Sue or any other T-Rex for that matter, I'd like you to take just a moment and imagine something even bigger. If all this talk about a real life sea monster that's bigger than T-Rex is not scary enough for you, I'd like to also add that they had an extra joint in their lower jaw, much like a snake, and an extra row of teeth on the roof of their mouth. Some of you might be relieved to hear that mosasaurs are extinct they lived during the late Cretaceous from about 95 to 66 million years ago, and they were wiped out by the same asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. Mosasaurs themselves are not dinosaurs, and they are also not related to the other marine reptiles you might know, things like the Loch Ness Monster plesiosaurs and dolphin-like ichthyosaurs. They are actually a special kind of lizard. And they are special because not only are they possibly the biggest lizard to ever live, but they were completely aquatic. So that means that they did not return to the land for anything. They didn't even crawl up on beaches to lay eggs like sea turtles do. They actually gave live birth in the water like a mammal. Mosasaur fossils have been found on every continent, including Antarctica, and they were the apex predators of the Cretaceous seas. Meaning the only thing that a full grown adult mosasaur would need to fear is another larger mosasaur. 
In life, they may have looked something like this. They had very long and streamlined or torpedo-like bodies. Their nostrils were on the top of their head because they still needed to come to the surface to breathe air. And they had flipper-like limbs and a paddle-like tail to help them swim. We actually know, thanks to this one incredible fossil, we know exactly what their flippers looked like because this fossil actually preserves the outline of the hands and the feet. And this same fossil also preserved the outline of the tail, which is super cool because we learned that their tails actually looked like shark's tails. So my research on mosasaurs is focused on two key ideas, ontogeny and evolution. Ontogeny is growth and development. So this is how an individual animal changes as it grows up. These changes can include bigger size, bone fusion, or in the case of this leopard gecko, color change. What's important about this, or what's important, one of the neat things about ontogeny is that any changes to it, so any changes to this process of how an animal is built as it grows up can have long-term consequences. In other words, changes to ontogeny have the potential to influence evolution. Evolution is changed to the DNA of a population or group of animals over time, usually over a very long time. And these changes are inherited through the generations. We can study evolution by comparing different features of living things. So we can compare the features that we can see, things like skeletons and shells, and we can also compare the DNA itself. What these comparisons tell us is how living things are related to one another. And this is really important because understanding these relationships is absolutely necessary to being able to ask and answer fundamental biological questions. We can show evolutionary relationships using diagrams called evolutionary trees. The way to think of these diagrams is as small specific groups that are contained within larger, more general groups. And these groups consist of living things that have special features in common. So the tree that I have here, for example, shows jawed vertebrates. Every animal on this tree has jaws and a backbone. Within that group, there's the bony fish, which all share a bony skeleton. Tetrapods are a special kind of bony fish that all have four legs. And finally, there are, within tetrapods, there are the amniotes, the mammals and the reptiles. And they all share an egg that is protected by a special membrane. Of course, I am most interested in the reptiles. This is what their evolutionary tree looks like. And we can see how mosasaurs over here are not related to dinosaurs, nor are they related to the other marine reptiles. They are literally a specific kind of lizard. Specifically, their closest living relatives are iguanas, snakes, and monitor lizards, including Komodo dragons. So why study mosasaurs? There's an awful lot of really cool reptiles out there, and there's definitely a lot of cool extinct animals. What makes mosasaurs so interesting? Well, mosasaurs, like many other aquatic animals, actually evolved from ancestors that lived on the land. And what's interesting about this is that it's happened more than once. It's happened in many different animals, living and extinct. They had ancestors that lived on the land that evolved to live in the sea. And what I really want to know, the big picture question that I'm trying to answer, is how does this keep happening? And what I mean by keep happening, again, is that this transition from living on the land to living in the sea has happened multiple different times separately in lots of different animals. I specifically want to know how a skeleton needs to change when a land animal becomes aquatic. Specifically, how do, these change, how do changes to the skeleton come about during ontogeny, and how do these changes ultimately build on one another during the course of evolution? Most importantly, between species, because this has happened independently or separately multiple different times, are the changes that happen to the skeleton when a land animal becomes aquatic different each time, or are they the same? In other words, is there only one way for evolution to make a sea monster, or are there many ways? But backing up a sec here, I guess I didn't really answer my question here. Why study mosasaurs specifically, especially now that I've told you that there's lots of other aquatic animals that have evolved from land ancestors? And the answer to this question is quite simple. They are perfect for studying this question. Mosasaurs are perfect for studying how land animals become aquatic for three main reasons. First, 
there's a lot of them. So not only do we literally have lots of their fossils, which is great for being able to do statistics and other kinds of scientific analyses, but because there are lots of different kinds of mosasaurs, ranging from the small lizard-like and semi-aquatic uh, forms to the giant ocean-going shark-like true mosasaurs themselves. So because they have this great fossil record preserving 30 million years of evolution, tracking their transition from living on the land to living in the sea, we can, in a sense, actually see how the skeleton changed during that time. Second, mosasaurs have these close living relatives, and these relatives range from living completely on the land to living completely in the sea. And this is important because there's some things that we just can't study in an extinct animal like a mosasaur. One of those things is the DNA. Mosasaurs lived a very long time ago, and DNA is very fragile, so it's not preserved. We do, however, have the DNA of living lizards. And the other thing is because they lived so long ago and there's no bringing them back, we can't actually watch a mosasaur embryo develop into an adult over time in real time. And that's something that we absolutely can do in living lizards. So by studying the DNA and the developmental patterns of living lizards and comparing them to one another and figuring out what they all have in common, we can then figure out what they might also share with their extinct relatives, the mosasaurs. And last but not least, mosasaurs are charismatic, which means they're great for outreach. They're super cool. They are literally real life sea serpents. So they're really good for getting people excited about biology, understanding the relevance of paleontology in the 21st century, and for getting people to think in an evolutionary context. Because when you look at that face, how can you not fall in love with it and want to know everything about it? And most importantly, how it came to be. So with that, I thank the organizers of this event for inviting me to speak and to you for listening. And I'd be more than happy to take questions. Awesome, thank you. Oh, I, you blew my mind thinking that that's a lizard because I think, I just can't, I still can't get over that alligators are not lizards. I just think that a mosasaur is a lizard, but an alligator is not. I just, I don't know how um, I'm gonna sleep tonight. But other than that, Awesome, thank you. Um, we've got a question from CP here. How did you? How do you know that they had live babies? There are supposedly fossils. I have not seen them myself, but there's supposedly one of a true mosasaur that has the embryos inside, so we can see them. And there's one of one of their really early relatives, so one that's still very lizard-like, and that one also has like the embryos preserved in it, which is really cool that they were already giving live birth before they had like the flippers and the big shark tail and all of that. Super cool. Um, the next question is from Lamira again. Um, do changes in animals or species usually come uh, in order to assist in survival? So usually, like usually yes, but not always. Like the cool thing about, about evolution is it's kind of unpredictable. Like you would think that it would make the most sense for animals to evolve things that help them to survive, but really it is, like you hear this saying, survival of the fittest, it's really survival of the adequate. Like whatever works gets passed on, but then ultimately, if an animal is able to reproduce and pass on its genes, that's what happens. Usually that happens to be things that help them survive, but, but not always. Awesome. Um, next question is from Abby. Uh, did these animals give birth to multiple babies at once or just like one at a time? We think so. Like, so the one, the, the, the early one that we do have babies like inside it, there's four of them, but as they grew to be bigger, like, so the one behind me at my museum is like 30 feet long. Things that were this size maybe only had one or two because that seems to be a trend among, um, you know, like big aquatic animals tend to just not have as many babies, especially when you have live babies because you have to put more energy into it for it to develop. And in other lizards that give live birth, today, I think they're, they're usually smaller numbers. Cool. Um, are there any lizards uh, now that, that are extant that uh, take care of their babies? Yes. So there is one that I know of. It's called the shingleback skink. It has one baby. It gives live birth and the baby stays with the mother for, for a full year. Wow. Super cool. 
I just love the idea of mosasaurs hanging out with their babies in the ocean. That's very cute. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was super cool. All right. The next talk is going to be from Danielle talking about freshwater ecology. You have the stage. Hey guys. All right. Let's share that. Make it go. Boop. Okay. Can you guys see it? Is it working? All good. Cool. All right. So hi, I am Danielle Wynn. I am a freshwater ecologist. I'm super excited to be here today. I've been doing Skype a scientist for a few years and I've been enjoying every single moment of it. So thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. Um, what we're going to talk about today is what does it mean to be a freshwater ecologist? This is a pretty high level overview. So if you guys have more specific questions, please throw them in. This is just a super high overview of what's going on. So I lead a group called Watershed Education and Outreach. So I'm a fun mix of educators slash scientists. So I really enjoying Skype scientists because it's just exactly what I love doing. So let's roll into it. All right, so basically, quickly, what do I do? Like, truthfully, I am a Lorax, but instead of speaking for trees, I speak for streams. And that's really what we do as freshwater ecologists. Here in Fairfax County, Virginia, where I am, um, Fairfax is 400 square miles and we have 1.1 million people in 400 square miles. So we actually have more people in our little county than six states have across the entire state. And because of that, we have a lot of streams that we need to protect, but also much more streams that we need to restore, like the picture you see on the top there. So we have a lot of issues in our streams. And the way we can figure out what's going on with our streams is by ecologists going out and doing some assessments. So in order for us to figure out how healthy or unhealthy that stream is, we really need to learn how do you best assess a stream. So we can't go out to a stream and say, hey stream, how you feeling? It's not going to say, I'm not doing so good, Danielle. Um, I'm too hot or I don't have enough oxygen or there's no trees around me. We can't really know because the streams obviously can't talk to us. So we have to figure out other ways to figure out how is that stream doing? Is it healthy? Is it unhealthy? What can we do to benefit that stream? So the way that we do that is we look at a series of indicators. There's many more indicators that we look at than are just right here, but these are just a few good examples. And as an ecologist, I look at not just living things, but I look at non-living things as well. So not things that are dead, but things that were never alive. So in that instance, I'm talking about things like water, soil, rocks, those would be abiotic factors that I would look at. But again, I also look at the living things, things like insects, fish, bacteria, plants, all kinds of different things. Again, I'm not talking about them all today in the interest of time, but we'll at least talk about insects and fish today and water and the shape of the stream and how all those things together help us as ecologists tell the story of their stream. So the first biotic factor we're gonna look at real quick is called benthic macroinvertebrate. It's a big word, but it's pretty simple. Let's break it down. Benthic means bottom. Macro means I can see with my eye. If I looked at something in a microscope, that means it's super small. So I need a microscope to look at it. Macro just means I can see with my eye. And invertebrate obviously is something that doesn't have a backbone. So benthic macroinvertebrates would be little creatures are living on the bottom of our streams. So like a clam, a crayfish, a worm, a stonefly, a mayfly, anything like that. Right now it's actually benthic season. So the other ecologists in my group are actually out doing some monitoring today. The way that we actually look for the benthics in our streams is we have to use nets. So you can see Chad over here is carrying the net. What you would do is you would look at different habitats across our stream. We look at hundred meter reaches, about 40 of them across Fairfax County and we job them. So we look at different habitat types we look at rocks, we look at roots, we look at sand, we look at snags, and we also look at veg. And we take samples of each of those habitats and we kind of pull all the bugs out and we take them to our lab and we ID them. And that helps us figure out how healthy or unhealthy our streams are. Now, some of our bugs can live in really dirty water and some of our bugs like to have really clean water all the time. So it's the kind of ideas as if, what kind of bedroom do you guys have? So the way I like to think about it is some people can live in really dirty bedrooms all the time and they're pretty tolerant of dirty bedrooms. So they would be the red guys up here are tolerant creatures. So in this example, it would be worms, flatworms, leeches, and some types of caddisflies. Then we have our creatures who 
kind of have a slightly dirty bedroom. Maybe they have like a plate or two and they have a small pile of laundry have, they have to get done. We'll call those moderate, uh, moderate benthics. So in this example, it would be uh, crayfish, stoneflies, sorry, crayfish, um, sow bugs, scuds, and some dragonflies. And then we have the benthics that have to have really clean bedrooms in order to want to be there. So like me, I always like to have my, my laundry put away and everything is good to go. So those would be stoneflies, mayflies, um, some other caddisflies, helger mites, and things like that. So when we go out to a stream, we can figure out how healthy is that stream or unhealthy by seeing who's living there. So if we go to a stream and we only find creatures that are tolerant of pollution, that means that stream is probably not doing very well. Not just right now, not this instance I grab my water sample or I grab those bugs, but in a longer period of time. Conversely, if we look at a stream and we find a bunch of those bugs that are also in the green category, that's sensitive, those clean bedroom kind of bugs, then I know that stream has to be clean all the time or I would never find those bugs there. So looking at the life really does help us figure out what's going on in that stream over a long period of time. We also look for fish. So to do fish, we can't just go out there and put out a fishing rod. Hopefully this will work. Boop, boop, boop. When is it gonna work? That's gonna work. Okay, this was supposed to be a movie. I don't know why it's not. Go, go, go. Okay, well, we'll just we'll just pretend that this is a movie. So in the back here, you can see me. I'm actually wearing a fish shocker. Um, the reason we use a fish shocker and not just a fish, uh, a line and reel is because we could just never get them out of fish. We also don't need seining nets, which are just big wide nets. So you drag up a stream because that would actually really damage the fish. It would bump into sticks and rocks and other fish. So using electricity sounds kind of crazy, but it's actually the easiest and most effective way to get our fish. So we net off a part of the stream and I would be coming, I'm really bummed that the, ah, that is just not working for some reason, that's okay. And I come up the stream and the electricity follows me because I'm actually putting electricity in the water. And then the fish kind of float up when they get shocked. They don't die because we don't want to kill fish, don't worry. They float up because most fish actually have an air bladder in them. It helps them um, not have to fight as hard to keep afloat. So we would scoop them up with nets, put them in buckets, and then we can ID them on the shore down to species, and then we just let them go. So it's not super invasive. I know it sounds scary for electricity, but it's fine. We have more than 60 species of fish across Fairfax County. We don't see every fish in every stream. Um, we actually have a coastal area, a Piedmont area, and a Triassic area in Fairfax County because we're super extra. So we would never see the same fish across all of those areas. So this is just an example of some like super fun, super exciting fish that we see. We often see largemouth bass. These are freshwater eels or not electric ones, which is freshwater. We have lovely sunfish. This is a red breast sunfish. We have mosquito fish, this guy, which I appreciate because I really hate getting bitten by mosquitoes. So these guys actually eat the mosquito larva. I appreciate it. This is my um, mosasaur. I forgot exactly how you say it for Amelia. Um, this is a snakehead. So this is actually a species that's invasive. It came over from Asia, has crazy teeth. It can get really, really big. We usually don't see them really big here in Fairfax because our streams are a little bit smaller. But if you catch them out in the Potomac, they'll get much, much bigger and they're, they're pretty crazy. We also have populations of goldfish, just because enough people have actually let their goldfish go um, from having them as pets, that certain areas of Fairfax actually do have viable populations of goldfish out there among our other native fish. Our most common fish though is the black-nosed dace. We find these more often than not. That's probably about 50% of our fish species across Fairfax County are these little minnow guys. So they're all over the place. As long as it's wet, pretty much they'll be there. The quality of water is really important for us to know too. So unlike um, looking at living things, we look at indicators of, is it sensitive, tolerant, or moderate? Um, quality water is really a snapshot. So it really lets us know what's going on in that moment of time. We can't always use it to predict what happened a while ago, because if you take your water sample and you test it, that water is gone. So from water here in Fairfax, within a few days, it's all the way down in the bay. So if somebody spilled, we'll say turpentine or something down a storm drain and it got into our streams and it had a fish kill, that stuff is gone. So 
the quality water gives us a snapshot of what's going on immediately. It's really the life that tells us what's going on in a longer period of time. Regardless, quality of water is really important. So whenever we do go out to look for the bugs, fish, or anything else, we always take our wise light probe and look at things like what's the temperature, what's the conductivity, what is, uh, how much dissolved oxygen is in there, all kinds of different things. Because it really does impact the quality of the water itself, which does impact what species of bugs and fish are able to actually live in those streams. These are just examples of terrible things that are going on in Fairfax, and I'm sure not just Fairfax too. We have over-fertilization in the right over here, where our streams and lakes become just green, grassy, almost looking lawns. And that really does impact um, our fish and benthic, and also our plants' ability to actually utilize our streams the way that they should be. We also have, so <clears throat> excuse me, also have soap sometimes getting in our stream. If people are washing their cars in front of a storm drain, <clears throat> that soapy water gets down at the storm drain and it really does affect our aquatic life. Imagine just being a fish and trying to breathe in soapy water through your gills. It's really gonna hurt. So if you do need to wash your car, don't do it in front of a storm drain. You can take it to a car wash. They are required to clean and recycle their water and that water goes to wastewater, not to storm water. Salt is a more recent issue that we have here in Fairfax. Um, it's becoming more and more apparent across the country as well. We have too much salt going on to our roads during the winter time. And it's an interesting conversation because you're balancing public safety from making sure people aren't crashing in the winter time versus the environmental health because all that extra salt that's been sitting on the road, if it rains or the snow or ice melts, that salt gets washed up and it goes down into our streams. And our streams can almost be close to salt water at certain times of the year, depending on how much salt is put out. So we definitely need to figure out a way how do we manage our salt better, or at least how do we pick up our salt more efficiently if a snowstorm didn't actually happen. Also looking at the shape of the stream, another abiotic factor, that tells us part of the story of the stream. We can look at a stream and we can pretty much quickly say, hey, this stream needs help or this need, stream needs to be protected. The stream on the left obviously looks really nice. It's a stream that should be protected. The stream on the right, however, obviously has some issues. Um, this is about a 20 foot cliff. This is sadly not the only stream in Fairfax County that looks like this. So we have to do either stream restorations or stream protection in order to figure out what streams need to be restored or what streams need to be protected. <clears throat> and depending on how bad a stream is, like this example, we'll have to pick different restoration techniques in order to prevent additional erosion from happening and going down um, and further impacting downstream. So that's my quick, what does it mean to be a freshwater ecologist? Now that you have seen this, you can kind of get the idea and help us tell the story of being a freshwater ecologist. Remember anyone who asks a question is a scientist. So please ask your questions at any time to anyone and just let them know, hey, you know, our streams are connected to our drinking water. A storm drain goes directly to our stream. It doesn't get treated. Don't put anything down the storm drain. Goldfish shouldn't be in our streams. They should be in our fish tanks. So all those good things. Now that you're aware of that, you're all scientists too. And what are some really simple things that anyone can do really at any age? One, plant natives, take out your grass, plant some natives in there. They do a great job actually soaking up extra water, preventing any kind of flooding from going on. Make sure there's trees next to your streams. Make sure if you're doing any kind of car washes for, for charity of any kind, just don't wash your car in front of a storm drain. That would be great. You can install rain gardens or rain barrels. You can also do things like stream cleanups, which is a great way to actually get out of nature and improve our stream quickly by just taking out the trash and making sure that it's left as pristine as it should be. So with that being said, I'd like to thank everyone again today. So WIO would like to thank you for inviting us here today. If you have any questions about either the monitoring aspect or of any of the education programs that we offer, please feel free to send me an email. I'm not at the office really anymore, so email is probably the way to go. And there's also a QR code over here that sends you directly to the Watershed Education and Outreach website. And you can see all the different programs that we do. We're happy to share them across the country. So just let me know if you guys are interested. So there you go. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. We got a number of questions for you here. Okay. First one is from Abby. Do you know if paw safe pet safe ice melter barrier or melter is better or worse for watersheds than traditional road salt? That's a great question. Um, it still has some components that should not be in our streams. Is it better? Yeah, it's better. 
Um, but the big thing is if you have extra on your surface after an event has occurred, if you could sweep that up, no matter what it is, that helps. Cool. Um, the next question is semi semi-related from Chanel. We have some regions here in Canada where they use beet juice to de-ice roads after light slash moderate storms. Would that be an ecologically sound solution uh, or alternative to salt? I have beet juice, like the root? And yeah. Really? I've never heard that. I'm fascinated. That sounds like it could also be really gruesome. I will look into that. I don't know if we have enough beets here in America to like create that as a possibility. I will certainly look into that. That's really fascinating. Interesting. Okay, so apparently Edmonton, Alberta also does that and it makes it smell bad, which is interesting. What? My grad school roommate was from Edmonton. And oh my gosh. Loved beets, like eight beets nonstop. I love beets. I mean, I'm German, so I have to eat beets all the time. So if anyone who who has these um, examples of of using beet juice, if you, if you can email me here, I'd be really curious to have a continued conversation with you about using beet juice um, as a de-icer. So please email me. We should really be talking about the antifreeze proteins. Maybe beets have antifreeze proteins in Maybe. them. Maybe, who knows? Maybe it's all, it's all coming together here. It's all coming um, together. Very cool. So Elena wants to know, uh, that in that picture that you showed that the stream was just like a straight up cliff of erosion, how would you restore a stream that looks like that? That's a great question. So there are restoration techniques. There's, there's a variety of restoration techniques. When you have something as insane as this, we often actually just move the stream away from this channel. Um, because the real goal for any stream restoration is to reconnect it to its floodplain. When it's disconnected like it is here, that's where it kind of continues to erode and evolve in not good ways. When it's this crazy, we, we just can't do it because the amount of scaping you would have to do to this forest to reconnect it would be devastating. So we actually will take a stream and move it. So if in this example, we'd move it, you know, well to the right and find a different floodplain that we could reconnect it to. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing that all that with us. That was really cool. Thank you everyone uh, also for, for coming today to listening to our awesome scientists and uh, for, for showing us your work in such easy to understand, accessible, engaging ways. Um, yeah. So uh, that's really all, all I, we have today. Thank you so much. Um, we just so, so for, for folks at home on uh, Wednesday, we're going to be talking about the intersection of science and art, specifically looking at um, illustrations with uh, prairie science. So we have a super, super cool scientist named Liz Kothick. Um, she'll be talking to us about how she uses art um, and comic making um, to communicate science. Uh, that's going to be at 1 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. So I hope to see you all then. Thank you to all of our scientists again who participated. I learned so much today and you were all really engaging and interesting and, and your work is so important and I'm so glad that you exist. Um, all right. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. <laughs>